You are back in the smoke-filled room. I'm sad to say, for me at least, it's not actually a smoke-filled room. I am in Butlerville right now because Michael and I have an event tonight in St. Clair County. So uh, the Republican Party here was nice enough to let me use their headquarters. So I got the White House behind me. I got a cutout of Abe behind me. This is great. It's not quite as good as having a cigar, but I am really grateful to be here in Southern Illinois. I do have to sign, like get a special passport to be allowed down here. So Michael, I appreciate you allowing me into your region. Um, we have with us uh, most of our political team here. We've got Abby, Chris, Matt, and Michael. John will be joining us a little less frequently moving forward, but we're excited to have John with us when he can join us. Uh, so but we've got uh, these four with us, and they'll continue to be with us, which is exciting. We've got a lot of topics to cover, but first you see Chris and Abby in their team's colors. Uh, we're recording this on Thursday, and I think there's going to be a little bit of a rivalry here. So I guess I start with that. Chris, you're up in Green Bay for the game tonight. So I guess you get to go first since you seem to be a little more dedicated. Oliver's still <laughs> just down here. So what do you got to say about tonight's uh, Packers-Lions game? The reporting live from Historic Lambeau Field. It's Chris Jakowiak with Core Strategies. I think it's going to be a very good game tonight. Um, I've seen the lines moving, the line moving a little bit in terms of the total for tonight's game. People start, mm -hmm. starting to think it might be a lower scoring game. I tend to believe it's going to be a high scoring game. Um, the Lions are a good team, so we can't take anything for granted tonight. But Green Bay, Jordan Love's look good. Um, so I'm excited for tonight's game and to hopefully bring home a Packers W. Ian, I'm looking forward to the Lions being the Packers for the fourth time in a row. That's really exciting for me. And I'm just thinking a lot about the last time the Lions are at Lambeau Field. You know, we ended Aaron Rodgers' career maybe in the NFL for forever. So, I mean, it really, no matter what happens, I'm a winner. So, yeah, I was being I, mean, I was being nice, and she just had to go out like that. But you I'm know. not a nice sports fan, so the, the Lions. Yeah, are a good I mean, team. Chris, you, you kind of played patty cake there, and Oliver just went right to the machete. You, not, you as as stand? Fans. It's not as bad as Bears fans, so always got to give them that. I mean, at least we don't have to watch, like, the Broncos Bears this week. Like, that's going to be pretty hey, terrible. Hey, 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 don't kick us when we're down. Our lives are bad enough as it is. I mean, it's no. it's it's not going to be a fun game to watch Broncos Bears. So let's just stay focused on the, the Lambeau Field game tonight. I don't, who says that that Lions Packers is going to be a low scoring affair? I mean, those are two teams where their their offenses are pretty good, especially on the Lions side. I, I don't. That doesn't seem to be to be a low scoring game. Yeah, total open I mean, 40, to, total open at forty six. Now it's moving down to forty five as of right now when I checked. So um, <laughs> we'll see where it, where it's at at game time. But the public's moving towards the under right now. All right. Well, good luck to both your teams. I don't like either of you, but I have no leg to stand on. So I'll let you guys duke it out and then I'll just cry myself to sleep on Sunday after my team it continues to be the dumpster fire that it is. All right, let's get into politics. Uh, we've got a number of topics, as always, to cover, and then we'll get into some campaign updates. We have more campaign updates than we typically do, so we're going to give that a little more time. But I've got a handful of topics here I want to get into first. The first being that we've talked about uh, the Goshen plant that Pritzker uh, and his team have been crowing about bringing to Illinois. And last week we talked about how sometimes good government doesn't make good politics and the optics of this at the very least are, are not great. And Pritzker is going to need to live with that and own it. Uh, we also talk about how Republicans, if they were smart, they'd go after Pritzker on this because uh, it's been successful in other states. And what we've seen over the last week is that Republicans have done so. Uh, it's to varying degrees of effectiveness. The state party did so on the fundraising side. Eh, the pitch wasn't overly great. I'm glad they tried. Uh, I think that could have been a much stronger pitch to raise money, but at least they they, they gave it an effort. Uh, but strong kudos to the Senate Republicans. Uh, they have done a really good job making this an issue. Uh, so I definitely wanted to give them a call out, especially their comms department. They did a great job on this. Basically, what they did is they sent a private letter to Pritzker. Uh, with some questions, some good government style. Hey, are, are these things that we have answers for? These are things we should be looking into. And Pritzker, as is his way, immediately jumped to um, leaking it to the press and then sending out a scathing press release uh, about how Republicans are xenophobes and just over the top. And, and really, this has become the 
um, the norm for Pritzker. Anytime anybody questions him, it's an over-the-top personal attack, slamming them in response. Instead of actually you know, looking at this and saying, hey, there's some things I should actually answer for as governor of this state, there's a lack of transparency, there's a lack of accountability, there's a lack of good government, uh, a lack of bipartisanship on the Pritzker side. And I love to see the Senate Republicans calling him out for it. So uh, curious what you guys think just on this back and forth between Pritzker and the Senate Republicans. And uh, it's nice to see some life out of the Republican Party. And uh, Pritzker's team is pretty adept at, at fighting this fight. Uh, so you're, you're never going to win every fight. But we're actually getting into some of these fights, which, frankly, the party hasn't done in a long time. So I'm pleased to see that. And uh, I want to see more of it in the future. But what are you guys seeing in this back and forth over, you know, for those who maybe didn't watch last week, Pritzker giving a uh, half a billion dollars in taxpayer funds to a company owned by China with a, with to it by owned by a Chinese company with ties to the Communist Party. I believe I described that properly. Uh, and uh, so the Republican Party's you know, have some rightful questions about this and, and bringing it up. What are you guys seeing? Yes, you know when someone's losing an argument when they just resort to personal attacks or saying things that are completely unrelated to the argument. And I think Pritzker is definitely doing this here. It's interesting that he tries to then pivot the conversation to talk about jobs and how he's pro jobs and how Republicans are anti jobs. So it's kind of interesting that he knows the message that he wants to get across and he doesn't care what other people are going to say or attack him with. He's just going to answer the question that he wants to answer, not necessarily the one that he's been asked. And I think Republicans can learn from that. Uh, voters hopefully will see that that's kind of wishy-washy and he's not actually addressing the issue, but it is interesting to note. And I think we should be paying close attention to when he does things like this. Well, and it is. A good... Go ahead, Abby. It wouldn't be a podcast here if I wasn't cutting off Michael Butler at some point. So why not keep going? I mean, honestly, like we talk about all the time about how Republicans tend to be, you know, playing checkers while the Democrats are playing 3D chess. And we tend to be reactionary versus sort of being going on the offensive. So I think it's really encouraging that we are starting to latch on to some of these issues. And even if it doesn't go somewhere with this this particular topic, if we continue doing similar things and build that momentum and build that consistency, I think it's going to bring more light to Pritzker's behavior on these issues and more issues. And, and maybe people are going to start paying attention. So I like that we're doing this. I'd like to see us be more aggressive like this in the future. So hopefully it continues. Yeah, I was going to echo similar sentiments. It's good to see the Illinois Republican Party, Senate Republicans, uh, House Freedom Caucus, they're all going after J.B. Pritzker on this issue, which is great. And we just need more of that because he's definitely giving us a lot of openings and opportunities, as we've talked about in previous podcasts. We just got to take advantage of them. I think my main uh, comment on this this topic is, we mentioned how the governor went public with, with this letter. I would have liked to have seen the Senate Republicans uh, go public this letter to begin with, just because we knew already that J.B. would have went public with it. It was the right thing to do, perhaps from a governmental standpoint, to keep things private to begin with. But sometimes you got to go public first. Sometimes you got to put this stuff out in the news first, get ahead of it, because it, it gave J.B. the ability to go to the press first and get his press day out of it. Um, so that's why I would like to have seen it happen first. Um, but, I other, but in general, I do think this is a good development. Uh, for the Senate Republicans going after the governor on this issue, um, because it's a big issue. And uh, like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, you know, we've been being sold down the water to China, China and Chinese companies last 30, 40 years. Uh, it just needs to stop and we need to start doing something about it. Yeah, I mean, I almost wonder, you know, Governor Pritzker's press shop is going to roll this out. I almost wonder if that was the Senate GOP's intention. Let him look like the partisan hack that he is, because you know he's going to leak this thing, and then you're not the ones who leaked it. So I get your point, Chris. The standard strategy here is to write the letter and then leak it yourself. Um, but uh, honestly, I like the fact that we're thinking strategically, and that seems like what the Senate GOP was doing here. So um, all in all, again, you, you, you get better at things the more you do it. So maybe tactically, uh, some of you guys might have said I would have done it this way or that way, but we certainly all agree uh, it's great that they're doing it. I mean, we're seeing a, a step up here by Republicans in the state. And if we're ever going to hold Pritzker accountable, we got to keep going after him. And he has a megaphone and he's got the press on his side. So you're not going to win every fight to uh, to what the DeRay's point was there. But you got to get in those fights. And, and sometimes they're going to stick. Sometimes they aren't. But I like to see that we're showing a little life as a party. So that's exciting. Any other final thoughts on this before we go to the next topic? All right, let's move to the next one. So this is something that 
I've brought up a couple of times and we're going to make it a major topic because I'm just sick and tired of this not being the major noise um, that it is in the state and the major news that it is in the state. So um, DCFS, I've brought it up a few times on how this needs to be a story. This needs to get more focus. To be honest, I got to tell you, this ought to be on the front page of every newspaper every stinking day until it's fixed. The, the problems that we're seeing, I, I just don't know if people understand the level to which this uh, a travesty has been for a very long time. We have a new audit this week that I want to highlight, and I'd like to talk about this for a minute because we're really at a point now where the problems in DCFS have been going on for so long and nothing has been done about it. And honestly, I don't understand why the the, the press isn't holding uh, Pritzker accountable. And forget the partisanship of this. I don't care who's in the governor's mansion at this time. When you have this level of a uh, massive controversy, it, it should be in the news. I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat. There, this should be news. This should be focused on. So Auditor General does a report. Um, they audit DCFS. They do this every, uh, they do this regularly. And what they found in this latest audit was that things have gotten worse over the last several years, not better. Their last audit showed that there were, I believe, 30 major problems that they identified. Now there's 33. So first of all, that completely eliminates Pritzker's excuse that this is all um, the Rauner administration's fault. We're making it better since I've been in office. Pritzker's been in office for five years, and these audits have shown that things have gotten worse under his care than better. So that whole talking point is done. You can't use that talking point anymore. But here's some of the things, some of the call-outs of this audit that just are, are gut-wrenching. Um, what we saw, let me see, I'm going to get some of this stuff. I'm just going to breeze through it. But uh, 17 out of 60 reports, let's see here, were not immediately communicated when there was child abuse or neglect. Um, state's attorney's offices were noted, notified between 218 and 920 days from the report date. So what is that? Almost a year to three years from when this actually happened, the, the state's attorney's offices are finally notified. Um, when child abuse or neglect happened while receiving care at a hospital, uh, the investigation oftentimes it took at least 34 days, and in at least one case, 885 days to actually be reported. Uh, when there was physical or sexual abuse, um, there, it's supposed to be reported within 10 days and schools are supposed to be notified. Um, and instead it's 129 to 890 days late that these things are actually reported. Um, I, I'm just looking through this. Uh, here's another one. Um, testing 25 alleged incidents of sexual abuse investigations, 24 out of 25, the department did not timely notify the schools. Um, for those 24 out of 25, which is 96%, 431 to 908 days. I, I just, it, it goes on and on and on like this. Uh, when you pull up, just Google DCFS and the problems. It is Time after time, these reports, one after another, of these ridiculous problems, and we're talking about kids, and we're talking about sexual abuse, we're talking about, in some cases, neglect that leads to death. I mean, right now, two DCFS workers are on trial in McHenry County because medical professionals said, this kid is not safe, he's being abused. DCFS says, nah, it's fine, everything's fine. The kid gets sent back home with the parents and the parents kill the kid. I mean, this is a five-year-old boy who's murdered. I don't understand why this, is more, why this isn't more of a story. Every time it comes up, Pritzker's administration says, yeah, we uh, threw a few extra bucks at it. And then that's it, it stops until another audit comes out that says just how awful things are. And because of time, I got through, what, three, four of the 10 or 15 things that I should be bringing up on how bad this is. It just, I got to tell you, this is one of the most sickening things that I've seen. And I don't understand why this is not more of a story. Uh, Republicans certainly should be hitting the governor on this, but I feel like this is bigger than that. I mean, I know our podcast is about politics, so let's talk about the politics of this. But honestly, to me, this is bigger than politics, but I know that's what our podcast is. So let's jump into the politics of how Republicans should be whacking away at Pritzker on this. I know Leader McComey put out a statement when this came, came out, and that's great, but honestly, this thing should be on TV. I mean, this should be everywhere uh, because there is no leg to stand on for Pritzker. Every quote, is sickening and worse than the previous code on the problems at DCFS. We should be hanging this around his neck. Um, get some funding and go put this thing in digital lives. Go put it up on TV. There's no defense. There's no excuse for Pritzker on this. You could drop his poll numbers like a rock if you use this. All right, I'll get off my soapbox for a minute if anyone else has thoughts on DCFS. It's, it's, it's completely unacceptable. 
And I don't understand why we anyone allows it to happen at all. Republican, Democrat, it really is irrelevant. But what I find fascinating is that, you know, during COVID, one of the big things that Republican activists hit upon was like COVID and the schools and how we were mistreating our children. And I feel like this is very much in that same vein. Why are we allowing these kids to be mistreated, like just without unchecked? Like, I feel like this isn't an, like an issue that, you know, again, regardless of party, but like this seems like it'd be right up our alleyway in terms of messaging. And I don't know why we're not talking about it. It's it's frustrating and it's unacceptable. And it's it's just, yeah. So. So my thing, my thing here is I, I, I struggle to see where this was during the last year's governor's election. Um, you know, we were the Republican Party was talking about a number of things, but this is one of those issues that you could get some press for. Um, and I remember last primary, I think the only Republican gubernatorial candidate who even mentioned DCFS ever might have been Schiff. Um, so I think we could have done a better job last year, but going forward, we need to make this a staple of a lot of me- the Republican Party needs to make this a staple of a lot of our messaging. I understand it's not a simple issue like crime or the economy or all those things, but. If you can point out that there are, you know, children at risk here at the DCFS system in our state, I think this can move some votes for the Republican Party going forward. Yeah, I mean, we're we're. I'm just looking at this. We're talking about kids. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and abuse and neglect, and, and it's three years to notify anybody about it. Three years in at least one of these cases um, that they're looking at for some of these. I mean, that is just. Think of the to- the terror that kid is living through for three years while somebody decides maybe I should file a report and do my damn job. I, I just I, it, this makes me more and more angry the more I see it. And honestly, we're talking about Chris. You say moving votes. I mean, this doesn't just move vote, one vote at a time. This moves hundreds of votes at a time. I mean, this is right. At, it right. It cuts out the heart of how Democrats care. Um, and it shows this is a great chance for Republicans to show that we actually do care. I mean, we do a, a whole course, a whole class on how people think and how people make decisions and moderate swing voters all the way to the left. They look at the world through a prism of caring and fairness. And you've got a, a major issue here where the left is showing that they don't care. Democrats are showing that they don't care about kids, um, the most vulnerable of kids in the state. And I'd imagine the DCFS we're talking about, these kids are, are in, in, in um, from poor communities, poor families, I'm sure a lot of minorities. You know, this hits at the heart of what the Democrats supposedly stand for. Uh, and you're right, Chris, nobody really used this in the governor's race last time. I mean, maybe maybe uh, Bailey wanted to, but had no money to do it. Who knows? But this absolutely should have been an issue, and it needs to be an issue moving forward. We've got years now to hang this around every Democrat's neck, and they're doing nothing about it. There are no excuses here. To your point, Colin, I think that we can use this to and, reinforce. You know, how are state's attorneys supposed to hold these people accountable whenever they're not getting notified of the of the alleged crimes, you know, until 200, 300, 400 days after they've occurred. Um, It's just another reason why so many people are, so many criminals are not being held accountable in this state and it's a problem because when they're not held accountable, they're just going to continue to perpetuate these crimes. And that's why we're seeing the statistics that we're seeing throughout this state, you know, not just in Chicago, but even in, you know, the Metro East and Southern Illinois. It's big. It's a serious problem. To your point, Colin, I think that this can be used to kind of back up the principles that represent some more Republican ideals. So, for example, we talk a lot about the issues as a party. We'll say we are pro-life, we're pro-family or whatever those things mean. But this adds some ways that we're actually pro-life because we care about children. And and this, this adds to that issue or it adds to being pro-family. And it kind of shows the principle behind it of we care about these people and we do have underlying values that aren't just the one-off kind of policy issues that the Democrats like to bring up. So I think this can reinforce the overall big tent picture of what Republican ideals can be and should be. Yeah, I I mean, I I think we want intellectual 
consistency, right? And if we're going to say that we're the party of, of family and life, then we really need to be the party of family and life. And this should be a, a centerpiece for us. And again, we're always looking for how do you frame an issue in a way that um, that is more popular? You know, instead of talking about guns, you got to talk about crime and safety. Um, same thing here. I mean, we always talk about how the pro-life issue is sometimes a challenge for us in general elections, especially in suburban areas. Um, but here we're talking about, you know, family and life is at the centerpiece of this issue. And so this we really should be seeing our, our pro-life base of the party, our pro-family organizations. They should be taking this cause up and making it their their number one cause and show. I mean, again, it's it's a a this is a, a positively polling way to engage on this issue. It's a wasted opportunity if we're not making this a centerpiece of some of our agendas. And I think a lot of those pro-life and pro-family organizations, this is um, a great cause for them to take up that puts them on the side of the majority, which doesn't often happen in this state. So yeah, Dory, I think that's a really good point. All right, any final thoughts on this topic? Appreciate you guys letting me go off on my rant, but uh, my previous rants about uh, talking about this issue didn't seem to move the needle. So I'm just going to keep ranting louder and longer until eventually somebody <laughs> pays attention. Eventually, just 60 minutes of talking about DCFS. We'll have four viewers, but those four viewers will really care about DCFS with me. Yeah, well, we'll submit all our topics for the week, and you're like, too bad, or it's DCFS. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. That's all we're going to talk about. 60 yeah. minutes. All right, let's move on from uh, my pet issue here. Let's talk about something that I'm sure is going to be such a surprise to everyone, which is all those promises that were made by environmentalists and Democrats when they passed CJA, um, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, that J there is key, uh, all those promises about the jobs that they were going to create uh, shockingly have just not come true. I, I know this is surprising to all of you. Because uh, anytime government says, hey, we're going to do this big piece of legislation and it's going to create hundreds and thousands of jobs, uh, you know, we always believe that government's right when they say that because every government program always creates lots and lots of jobs. I'm trying to find from back when CJ was passed, I'm um, looking back to old emails from uh, 2020 when that whole debate was going on, because I know there were specific numbers. They had promised a specific number of jobs if this passed, because uh, that was the centerpiece of this legislation, was the job side. We did some polling. Um, is this it? No. Nah, see if somebody can find this while I'm while I'm talking, because uh, I should have found this before we started, but we're on a time crunch today. Uh, but we did polling uh, on this issue a lot back in 2020. And what we found is that the 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 message that tested the best for the left was the jobs aspect of this. That's why they called this the Clean Energy Jobs Act, um, because every message that we tested, the environmental aspects played okay. But when you talked about green jobs, that was their number one polling message on their side of the aisle on this issue. And so they made that the centerpiece of this, that it was going to create all these green jobs. Well, now it's it's come out. Um, that Illinois has not created the green jobs that it was supposed to have created because apparently uh, Illinois government just hasn't done what they're supposed to do. So Biden's pushing. Uh, he issued an executive order um, to through the American Climate Corps uh, to hire 20,000 young adults in the clean energy, climate protecting jobs area. Um, but the state was supposed to do something very similar over the last couple of years. Uh, and supposedly it's so far created zero jobs because they haven't actually done what they need to do on the state side. And all these organizations want to push forward on CJA and want to do things to create jobs. So I give them credit. But of course, the state hasn't done their part. Uh, so is anybody here shocked that a big uh, leftist bill that they message to say that it was supposedly going to do great things for the economy and create tons and tons of jobs, that it hasn't actually done that? Don't everybody speak at once. Well, you asked if anybody was surprised, Colin, and I don't think anybody is. Um, this is another one of those instances where the idea of jobs is really appealing to the average voter and the average worker, but it's not actually happening in this state. And that's one of the big issues with, with environmental policy in general and the radical direction environmental policy is going. Um, there's something in the bill um, or at least the idea behind the bill is that we want to be a renewable energy only state uh, within the next you know, 30, 40 years. It might be even sooner than that. But people end up realizing that that's actually an almost impossible goal. So what, you end up, what ends up happening is you have most of these jobs going absolutely nowhere and the money going absolutely nowhere. So um, I'd like to see more clean energy jobs. I think everybody here would agree that clean energy is a good thing in some degree or another. But 
Um, the problem is it's just going on a sinkhole that is, you know, the bureaucracy of Illinois politics. So um, it's going to have to take take a, you know, a very substantial turn in order to actually see anybody create jobs, meaningful jobs, I should say, in the state. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I'm a, I'm fully on board with investing in in green energy. I think it should be a buffet approach and all of the above approach in, instead of it just only being um, what, of course, the uh, left wants to allow. I mean, we see what they're doing right now with nuclear energy in the state. It's you know a great step on the way to a carbon free energy sector, and yet uh, environmentalists don't let the the left or Illinois government. Uh, move forward with any sort of even these small modular re reactors. So, I mean, I think if we had an actual common sense approach, uh, yeah, I think we'd all be on board with it. The problem is right now you've got uh, terrorists on the far left who want to hold our politics hostage and say only the type of energy sources that they support can be pushed forward. So as a result, we see our energy sector in this state lagging. Uh, we are now an energy importer instead of energy exporter. And so now we're importing energy from states who don't produce their energy through clean ways. We're importing from coal-driven states. So we've actually stopped producing this energy from nuclear, which is way cleaner than coal, and we're importing it from states that are using coal and other dirty sources uh, to create their energy. I mean, it's just such an asinine way, a back out, bass backwards way of doing this. And yes, I flipped those words on purpose. Uh, but it's just the bureaucracy, as you said. I finally found the the, the uh, paragraph I was looking for here about how these renewable energy companies they have diversity requirements, and so they have to f hire from state sponsored workforce programs. And here we are, two years later, and those programs aren't actually in place. So it's just bureaucracy, to Chris's point, that has created this problem unnecessarily and here we are we're supposed to be carbon free in 20 years a little over 20 years uh and i don't see how we're anywhere near a path to making that happen well you see it like on the federal level and then also on the state level where you know there there's these big pushes we're environmentally friendly we need to do wind and solar and all of these sure. things um but it's not it's not to the point where that can it's not we're not to the point where that can make up the difference, you know, from coal and oil and natural gas. Um, it's just we're going to have black brownouts and blackouts and those kind of things. Um, and we're becoming more reliant on other states from an Illinois perspective and other countries from a national perspective. And that's like a big security risk. You don't want to be in reliant on China and Saudi Arabia and Russia and all of these countries for our energy when they could just turn it off overnight or send the prices through the roof like they have been doing. You know, one thing that I was kind of thinking about in regards to this is, and maybe this is a conspiracy, but I will give Pritzker and the devils their due of, as we were talking about Gosha and when they were, when he was trading, Goshen. um, Goshen, when he was trading blows with John Curran, the thing that that J.B. Pritzker chose to highlight was the fact that this was bringing a lot of jobs into Illinois, into this district. And it seems like this is a common thing that Democrats do is when they know that they're going to get confronted with one issue on a different side, instead of just apologizing for it or or addressing it in the way one of us would, they lean into it harder, or, or they just completely deny it or say the exact opposite. And we see this with a lot of politicians. So I wouldn't be surprised if J.B. Pritzker, from now on, or for the next few days or whatever, he doesn't actually address this issue that it didn't do, CJ didn't do anything, but he just says, oh, look at this area, we're making more jobs. Look at this area. I wouldn't be well, surprised yeah, if he's gaslighting I think that's people. a... I think that's a good point, Duray. I mean, here's an interesting thing. Every time there's any sort of pushback on, on Pritzker or on the left, they say, look, this is going to create jobs. We hear it over and over. Jobs, 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 jobs. Okay. I love that. But then why is Illinois in um, the bottom five or top five, depending on how you look at it, in worst unemployment states in the entire country? If these all these actions by Pritzker and the left are supposedly creating all these jobs, 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 then why are we at, at various times over the last year, we've been worse. Now I think we're fifth worst. Um, if the most recent numbers that I'm looking at are still accurate, we're in the bottom here or the worst states for employment or best states for unemployment, which is a bad way to look at it. But either way, if we're creating all these jobs, supposedly, then why is our unemployment so bad in the state compared to all the rest of the states in the country? I think that's a very interesting point, Duran. At a certain point, you got to flip that around and say, okay, Pritzker, you keep saying this is creating jobs. Where are the dang jobs? Are the, yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's an interesting point. And, I, and maybe this is a reference from somewhere. Maybe I'm just totally brilliant coming up with this on the spot. But, you know, I'm always here. What are the top three issues you should talk about when you're running for office? Jobs, jobs, and jobs. So it doesn't matter if it's actually true. It's what people want to hear that, you know, they're doing something productive. They're putting money in their pockets. So, I mean, it's a smart strategy. It's like, it's what he always does. He, he uses something that sounds great to distract us from what's really going on um, behind the scenes. So. It seems to me that the only jobs that are actually being created here are the ones that uh, en environmental NGOs and consulting firms who tell the state and lobbyists, those, those, those are the, the jobs that are actually being created. Environmental lobbyists going down to Springfield and telling these politicians they need to pass these bills in order to make their uh, state non um, only renewable energy in 40 years. Yeah, it's good work for the lobbyists. You're not wrong on that. Butler, what were you trying to say? Oh, yeah, that classic Joe Biden quote where he says, uh, I always tell Barack Obama that jobs is a three letter word, J-O-B-S. So if you if you think that Joe Biden's bad now, he's always been that way. It's not a new development. <laughs> um, all right. So we've uh, we've kicked this issue. Let's go to the last one we have before we get into our campaign updates. I know some of you also want to talk about the presidential updates since we had the second debate this week. So we'll make sure we have some time for that. Chris always uh, tells us it's a waste of time, but Chris also, uh, you know, has his favorite. So we'll let other people jump in if they have thoughts. I also want to hear what DeRay says about his boy starting to, seems like his boy starting to tank, but we'll get to that later. Uh, first, uh, Illinois political update on the Republican side. Former Illinois Republican Party chairman Pat Brady has joined the personal PAC board. Uh, and I just want to get your thoughts on uh, on this. I have to imagine it's not going to be overly popular with this group. So I'll let you guys go first on this one, and then I'll maybe uh, cap with, with, I think, what this was supposed to accomplish, even though I'm not sure it will accomplish that. Yeah, so I got this sent to me by a uh, friend of mine in politics, and I, at first he said that I've been had. I thought the Bradys were humble funeral home operators, and I had to explain to him there's like eight different Bradys, and you know, Dan Brady's a good one who everybody likes, but Pat Brady's a grifter who nobody likes. And that's what exactly this is. This is another classic Pat Brady grift. And if he's watching this, this right now, I want him to know that I said that personally. Because how how evil, and I'm saying the word evil here, and I mean this word evil, how evil do you have to be to go join Big Baby Killer? Because that's what this is. Personal Pack is the most extreme branch of the, of the pro-choice, pro-abortion industry. And he's going from, he's saying, you know, we, the Republican Party needs to be more moderate, you know, support a woman's right to choose. Well, that's not what you're doing. You're going over there and you're advocating lock, stock, and barrel for late-term abortion, taxpayer funding of abortion. And that's just terrible. You know, it, it, in, in Pat Brady's perfect world, there'd be zero taxes but the ta or near minimal taxes. But those taxes would go to paying for other women's abortions. So he's a grifter. He's a horrible human being. I hope he never comes anywhere close to politics in the state again. And I hope he stays in his stupid little radio broadcast. There's no influence whatsoever. And I'm glad that some of the bitch is gone. Thank you. So just well, that's, uh, what, what, that's like a McClure level rant that I don't think I'll ever reach. I think I'm a, I'm a little too balanced to uh, pull off a rant like that. You guys keep putting me to shame. Go ahead, Oliver. Well, just to play devil's advocate here, so do you think maybe he's trying to join join this pack to give the impression that all, all Republicans or Republicans are sort of you know de, I don't know divisive or they they have a wide ranging views on on the, the pro life issue? I mean, I mean, I can see that kind of being his lane again. I don't think that's what it is, but I mean, I maybe that was the logic. goal. No, 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 Dre, Dre, I'm stopping. Dre, stop. What he's doing here All right. is he's, he wants attention. And we're giving him attention right now, but I know we're, we're playing into his own hand, but he wants attention. He wants people to talk about, oh, look at Dan Brady. He's over at Personal Pack now. Well, that, that's what he wants. Dan he wants Brady? Hold on, goes, hold on. Pat, 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 Pat Brady. Brady. Pat Brady. Pat Brady. Brady. Pat Brady. This is what Dan Brady's confused, a great Chris. man. I apologize to him. I apologize. I, I think I'm, I'm, Abby, I'm, Abby, I think that was his goal, but – if anyone actually thinks that one person is going to go into personal pack and make Republicans look good in that room, or they think that personal pack is going to give any money to Republicans, I think that they're nuts. And I think all I think this does is it right? angers. Yeah, just... I think all it does is this angers Republicans who put their faith and trust in the Republican Party. And then they see all these leaders who are kind of betraying them. 
Um, and there are a lot of pro-choice Republicans, and I think they do have a place in the Republican Party. But the common sentiment that we keep hearing, at least I keep hearing, is, oh, we put our faith and trust in these Republican leaders that are going to stand for us, and then they go and work with the Democrats. So I think that all it does is anger the people that you don't want to be angering, but it's not actually doing anything. He's not convincing anyone. He's not changing any hearts and minds, except for Republicans. I just don't even want to be associated with the person. Like, it's just one thing after another with him. Like, okay, now he's supporting Planned Parenthood through personal PAC. Like, he goes on all these radio shows and TV shows and talks about how terrible Republicans are. And I'm sure they give him high fives and pat him on the back, you know, as he's coming in and leaving the studio and all of those things. But it's not good for us as a party. Um, it's very detrimental. Um, and it's just terrible to see. And yeah, I'm just not about it. Well, that's why his well, name is Pat, because he's in it for the pat on the back. So. Yep, yep, yep. That was weak, Matt, but it was a good try. Um, I, listen, I, I think there's a couple of really good points here. The first being, what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? And we get sent stories every week about like, hey, this this is a juicy story that everyone loves this gossip and it makes Republicans look bad and it doesn't accomplish anything. And we just, we don't cover those things. We're, we're here. Yeah, we're going to tell the truth. And we, we've often talked about how in many cases, there's an opportunity to do things better. Uh, and we talk about that on the show, but we're also, we don't exist here just to rip on Republicans because yeah, that's a great, to Michael's point, that's a great path to getting the, the media love you. I mean, their favorite Republican is a Republican who rips on Republicans. So yeah, it's a great way to get on the on TV and get on the radio all the time. Um, but is it productive for our party? Does it move us forward? Does it actually in some way help further our cause? No, that doesn't. So I, I think that's a really valid point. I do think um, that at least part of Pat Brady's goal here was just try to force forward that big tent party kind of concept. It wasn't his whole goal. He has other goals, which you guys have covered very well. Um, and Pat Brady likes to, you know, get his name out there and wants to be, uh, uh, you know, front and center as often as possible when there's a news camera around. So that is also true. But I do think that at least a part of his goal was to further that sort of big tent Republican concept. But here's the problem, as you guys really well pointed out. You didn't just join some moderate, kind of slightly left of center organization. If there, I mean, there isn't really any abortion organization in Illinois like that. But if there was, I could see them, Pat, joining that organization and saying, hey, listen, if you're pro-life, you don't agree with me that I'm joining this organization. But I think, you know, pro-choice, pro-life, we all have a, a space in this party. OK, great. But to the point that several of you made, that is not personal pack. Personal pack is the furthest, 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 furthest left you can get on this and pretty much any other issue. Um, right. They are militantly anti-pro-life, anti-Republican, anti-conservatives. This is not an organization that mm. in any way is ever going to align with Republicans on anything. As a matter of fact, I have seen them go after pro-choice Republicans because they weren't pro-choice enough or because they happen to be Republican. This is not an organization that has ever ever had an interest in being bipartisan or in working with our side of the aisle. And so while that may have been partially his goal, if he was so naive, and I think Pat's actually pretty smart, so I don't think he's he's dumb enough to have been played like this. If he's so naive that he thinks this is in some way going to help the party, um, then he just got played. And, and that's just it's it's that is as simple as that. Well if you're if you're personal pack or one of these kind of pro-choice groups or organizations and you have an option between a pro-choice Republican and a pro-choice Democrat, they're going to pick the pro-choice Democrat every time because they know they're going to get a hundred percent what they want out of that person. And they're going to get, you know, a lesser percentage from a pro-choice Republican. I mean, it's just like, come on, there's no really real path here. Like it's kind of, I don't know, it's like beating your head against the wall. Like it's just not going to happen. Well, and again, I, I I do like the idea of pushing forward a big tent party. I'm not ideal, ideolo, ideological. Um, you know, to me, we need conservatives, we need moderates, we need libertarians, we need establishment Republicans, we need everybody under this tent, especially in a state this blue. So I get that concept, and I support that wholeheartedly. The problem is that's not what this is. Um, it, at best, uh, it's an opportunity for 
uh, the the far far left on this issue to to put someone like Pat Brady on, up on stage to say how crazy his party is and for them to all clap and be like yeah Republicans are crazy which doesn't do anything to help us and at worst um, it, it hurts us even further in a state that we can't we really can't be hurt uh, too much further um, and it's just a chance for Pat to get his name out there so I, I just I hate it I don't I don't love it and you know me I I, I want to find the best in each situation and I want a big tent party but that's just not what this is uh, it's it's painful um, and either Pat got played or he just is chasing um, you know the latest opportunity neither one really works super well so uh, I don't love it um, I wish I hope that we do more to increase the size of the tent of our party. So that would be a good thing. And if there is some sort of moderate Democrat organization out there on an issue like life and abortion, let's start to work with them. But so far right now, uh, as Dan Lipinski and other moderate Democrats will tell you, there's just no place on the left for any any space on the issue of abortion. You're either 100% pro-abortion or you are evil, you are Republican, you are conservative, you hate women. That there's, they are, it is that with Democrats, it is that with the far left. There's no place for the Lipinskis of the world anymore. Michael, go ahead. You unmuted. We're in the same room, so we got to create it with our muted. Go ahead. Uh, I just think that there's a lot of other places that we can make inroads with moderates and people that are left of center. And this is not one of the issues that we have a lot of opportunity with that our efforts and time would be better spent elsewhere. All right. I think we've exhausted this topic. Let's get into campaign campaign updates with the time that we have left. We've got a number of things to get go through here. Some of these we'll spend a little more time on. Some of these we'll spend less time on. Special thanks to Lane, who started to pull up the maps of these as we start to talk about them. We've heard that's a very helpful thing, as not everybody lives this world like we do. So when we say District 32, we know what that means, but many of our watchers and listeners don't. Uh, so if you're watching this on YouTube, obviously it doesn't show up if you're listening on Spotify. But if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to start to see these maps come up. Special thanks to Lane Davis for making that happen. So last week, we brought up Wes Cash. Uh, who is primarying Senator Terry Bryant in Senate District 58. But Michael wasn't able to join us because we were in Will County. So, Michael, why don't you jump in with your thoughts on this whole messy situation? Yeah, sounds good. So a little bit of background. So Wesley Cash ran in the Republican primary last cycle for county board in Franklin County, got last place in that primary. He had expressed interest and in pulled the packet to run for a, a primary against the Franklin County Circuit Clerk, who is a Republican, um, but sometime in the last couple of weeks, he was convinced that to primary Terry Bryant. Um, I heard that he was asking people as recently as this uh, this past week if he could if it was OK for him to run for Circuit Clerk and for State Senate at the same time. So that kind of shows you the caliber of candidate that he is. Um, his dad and grandma contributed about, I think, $251,000 to his campaign um, on Thursday of last week, but they illegally violated, or they illegally, that was a, it, they violated the uh, state, the campaign finance Contribution laws. Caps. Yeah. yeah, I can't get it out, uh, but they, they violated the campaign finance laws. They illegally broke the caps by doing that. So he had kind of had to return the money and then they shuffled it around a little bit. Um, and then three days ago, they put that money back in in a legal manner. So he's sitting on a little over $300,000 right now from those two contributors. Um, we're hearing that he may have as much as $700,000 promised to him if he needs it. Um, so he's going to have a lot of money. But the question is, is he going to be able to um, kind of paper over some of these mistakes and issues and weaknesses that he has um, as a candidate. I mean, why don't you catch people up on what those are? We kind of touched on it a little bit last week, but um, obviously you know more about this than than we do. So uh, kind of update our watchers and listeners on you know what the challenge is here. And then let's talk about who he's challenging. I mean, Terry Bryant is pretty rock solid conservative. A couple of votes that conservatives don't like, so I'll grant them that. But it doesn't look like that's why they're doing this. It's more for them about getting their people in office than it is about in any way trying to move forward the conservative cause. That's true. I mean, obviously they bring up the gas tax vote. They're going to bring that up until uh, the end of time. You know, they think that is like the unforgivable sin and 
They've been beating that. I mean, here's the thing. Forever. If there's any tax that Republicans support, it is a gas tax. McHenry County just upped their gas tax and it was a Republican led initiative in a very Republican county. So, I mean, honestly, when it comes to infrastructure, that's one of the few taxes that Republicans tend to actually support um, to fix roads and fix infrastructure. So, I mean, it's um, if you if you want to say, hey, we never, ever, ever pay any taxes whatsoever. Let's just let the roads crumble. I know there are some people who think that way, but there's a difference between fiscal responsibility and fiscal conservative. And responsibility says, hey, let's go fix the furnace before it breaks um, so that we don't have to buy a brand new furnace. Fiscal conservatism says, let's not spend a penny. Then the furnace breaks, and now we got to spend 10 times as much to buy a new furnace. So it's just, it's it's not smart. It's not responsible. Uh, and part of the motivation, you know, we have other primaries in this region. So there's a thought or a mindset that the more candidates that are running for office, the you know, that benefits other candidates like Dave Severin has an opponent, Angela Evans, who's running for state representative. And then obviously we have the Boss Bailey primary as well. So you've got these people that are, you know, Wesley Cash, Angela Evans, that are kind of aligned with that Bailey crew. Um, and they see that as a benefit. Um, but we'll see how that really plays out, because obviously that's a mo that's a motivator for Terry Bryant and some of these other people to get out there and work harder too. So it's not necessarily um, a one-sided deal. Yeah. To that point, I mean, Terry Bryant is a super, super, super hard worker. Um, I, I'm almost scared to see how hard she works between now and March. Like I, I, I don't know how she could have any more energy, but you certainly just lit a fire under Terry Bryant that I'm not sure they're ready for. Yeah. I heard she raised $10,000 yesterday. Just like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a far, far cry from 300, but I think she had a, what, over 100 in the bank already? She had, yeah, about a 150 cash on hand already. So, you know, she's going to crank it up and th the money will start rolling in. So it's good. All right. Um, and I think there was a funny, there's a funny meme going around. Well, not really officially a meme, but um, <laughs> Lane will bring it up on screen here of uh, a photo of, this uh, cash and and Bailey and what's like a diner or something. Yeah. Um, and it's just funny in general because it looks super awkward and some of the other people <laughs> in the photo look super awkward, but we'll we'll, we'll skip that. Uh, but it's uh, this was West guy asking Bailey, what is it? What is it, Michael? It says, uh, what is a what does a state senator actually do? And Bailey's like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that's basically <laughs> it. It's hilarious. That's pretty funny. Uh, so we'll bring that up on screen. I'm sure uh, I'm sure Michael will get calls about it, but it's funny. So, hey, what are you going to do? Um, all right, let's keep moving. We are actually almost out of time, shockingly. Uh, Michael, don't, let's not spend a ton of time on it, but since you weren't here last week, what's the latest in the Bost versus Bailey primary? I know there's a couple developments in that race. Yeah, uh, you know, Boss is working on some legislation to expunge some of the impeachment uh, or the two impeachments that uh, Trump faced during his first term. Um, he also voted against um, additional funding for Ukraine, you know, citing that we need some accountability here and it needs we need transparency on how this money's being spent. Um, so Mike just continues to have a perfect voting record, which is good to see. Um, Trump, Darren's obviously making the rounds and he was in Michigan yesterday for Trump speech to the union workers, and he's going to kind of continue to play that angle, it seems like, all the way through. So we'll see how it works out for him. All right. Uh, we'll keep everybody posted, but for time, let's just keep moving along. Let's talk about House District 76. This is going to be probably one of the, the big races. So you're going to hear us talk about HD 76 a lot over the next year plus. Um, as a reminder, this is that Lance Yednock district. Michael, can you mute? On your side, I'm getting the echo. Um, this is that Lance Yednock district. It is officially on paper just a D2 district under Yednock. He, he did better in that district, and some other Democrats have done better. Um, but the progressive tax did very poorly in the district. It's it's a winnable district on paper, especially depending on who the Democrats nominate. So we've talked a lot about the Republican side and how that's going to be a pretty bloody primary on the Republican side. It now looks like there's going to be a bloody primary on the Democratic side. The mayor of DeKalb, which is newly drawn into the district, um, is Cohen Barnes, and he's announced that he's going to be running for the district, which is interesting because he represents a fairly left of center community um, in DeKalb. It's obviously a college town with NIU there, but he's actually more of a moderate. He's an outspoken moderate. He calls himself a moderate. 
um, and even voted in the Republican primary in 2022. Uh, now trying to run in the 2023-2024 Democratic primary, having just voted in a Republican primary, um, where no moderate Democrats tend to make it through primaries in the first place. Um, the chosen, Yednak's chosen candidate, Amy Briel, is in it, and she's also more of a moderate. There is a spoiler in the race, Car Carolyn Zasada, who I don't know much about, no one seems to know much about, but if she runs to the left of these other two, uh, she seems to have a pretty wide open lane in that primary, um, and that would be a huge coup for Republicans. If two moderates run on the Democratic side and a, and a progressive is able to get through it, that is a working class district. That is not a liberal district. Now, with DeKalb in the district in the presidential year, it's probably going to play a little bit high for Democrats than D2 because uh, it is a presidential year. But if they run a progressive, the rest of that district is not super progressive. So we'll be watching that primary really, really closely. Anyone else? I know John would probably have thoughts in this district. It's definitely in his wheelhouse. Anybody else have thoughts on 76 um, and uh, the opportunity here? One of the things yeah, that worries me is as Republicans, we've said last cycle and the cycle before a lot that, oh, we want the really far left progressive to win the primary because it'll be easier to beat them in the general. But then all of a sudden, all these far left progressives that we thought that we could beat actually started winning. So mm -hmm. I don't know what to think anymore. Do we want to, to have the moderate win, even though they might have a better chance of winning the general? Or do we do we roll the dice on it? So that's a conundrum Republicans have. I mean, so your so your point, Michael, is let's we want them to nominate the progressive, and then we need to be better, so we actually beat them. Is that is that basically your point here? I don't know if I had a point. It's just we shouldn't want the progressive to win, even though we used to want to, because they might end up winning the general. Well, I think regardless of what, how this primary plays out, there's like two openings. One, if they nominate somebody who is too progressive for the district okay then there's an opening there we can beat them up for being far left and all this stuff um but if cullen barnes wins then we make sure that democrat voters understand that this guy is not one of you and he voted in republican primaries um and you know maybe they'll leave that bubble blank or you know not vote on that office um if we get that message out there so i think it's kind of there's two paths and it just kind of we just got to see what the lay of the land is on march 20th once this primary is over but hopefully they beat the crap out of each other the next six months it'd be wonderful i mean we're probably gonna do that on our side in that race too but um to your point michael you're right uh and one of the tactics republicans have actually done well over the last couple of years and last couple of cycles is what you're talking about which is basically send out a fake postcard from let's say re the republican party to hard Democrats, urging them, saying, hey, fellow Republicans, you need to vote for, in this case, Cohen Barnes, because he's a Republican just like us. He's voted in Republican primaries as an accident, sending that to hard Ds. And of course, hard Ds are going to see that and go, wait, what? This guy's a Republican. So it's a tactic that Republicans have shown in the state that they're actually willing to do. It's one of the few strategery type things that we uh, we actually uh, deploy in this state. So you're right, Michael, if we do get to the general and it is Barnes, I'd imagine that is something mm -hmm. they're going to do. Chris, you want to jump in here. I saw you unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly bring up this Cohen Barnes guy. He voted in Republican primaries before. It's one of those things where you think the Republican Party might have made a play to get this guy to be the Republican nominee for this district. Might have actually went a little bit uh, better for us. But as we're seeing, a lot of people, even if they are Republicans um, and more Republican leaning, and when opportunities like these this pick to, um, come up, they always try tend to go with the Democratic side of things because they know they can – frankly actually win because they I mean, I mean that's how it is you know this guy's gonna run he's more moderate but he's gonna run as a democrat because he knows he's got a better chance winning as a democrat and he knows democrats will probably back him up once he gets to november if he ran as a republican he doesn't know where he stands on the republican total the hro totem pole because you know they might lose five seats they might lose six seats who knows um so they might not want to play in a pickup opportunity in 76 so um it's a sad thing you know that good people are just becoming democrats well, and I think to your point, Chris, I, I want to key on a certain point you made early on there, which is would he have made it like in the Republican side? Could he have made it through a primary? I mean, on the Democrat side, he's voted in two Democrat primaries and one Republican primary in recent history. So um, he, they're going to vilify him for that one Republican vote. If he ran on the Republican side, having voted twice as a Democrat, He's, he would get skewered for that. I don't see how he makes it through a primary. So I think there's even a, a story there of this sounds like somebody we'd want in our party, mayor of a of a decent sized town, uh, good uh, background, good history, good experience. 
uh, a moderate leader, somebody who focuses on fiscal issues and is an executive of a town. You know, that's kind of the model of who we should want as a Republican in our party. But my question would be, even if he wanted to run as a Republican, would the Republican Party take him? Would they want him? We should. But in the party that exists today, as much as I, you know, I've, I've been saying nice things about my party today, but um, this one, I don't know. I, I doubt he would have made it through a primary. And so that, that kind of reminds you, if we're going to be a big tent party, if we're going to recruit people into our party to run, we got to allow for, I mean, we've got a state's attorney candidate up in Lake County who, yeah, okay, great. She pulled the Dem ballot in the past. That's made people a lot nervous, lot, uh, very nervous to back her. Um, but if we want to have a big tent and recruit candidates, then Cohen Barnes should have a place in our party. And right now, I don't know that he does. So, Chris, I think you make a, a pretty solid point there. One thing on that, Colin, is I think it really comes down to how the candidate uses their background and explains it to people. So like a candidate who comes out and says, yes, I was a Democrat, but I saw that these were the problems with the Democrat Party. And now this is why I'm a Republican. I'm owning up to that fact that I've changed or that the Democrat Party left me. I've seen a lot more of a positive response than candidates who just try and ignore it or brush it off. So I think it really comes down to how can the candidate deal with their past and effectively message that and communicate it and in some cases own up to it. And that makes a world of a difference. Well, listen, I mean, I, I do a lot of work in Texas and we do a lot of trainings in Texas uh, uh, with the Republican Party down there. And we just saw Mayor, Mayor Eric Johnson in Dallas switch from Democrat to Republican and um, uh, the party embraced him. I mean, you had Ted Cruz and many others who were you know, cheering for that. So and this isn't the case in every state. Uh, but right now in Illinois, there is certainly that purity test that we tend to uh, to hold our candidates to. And many of them, uh, even the purest of Republicans, sometimes can't uh, stand up to it. I mean, Michael, listen, what? I'm down here with you and, and I have to hear all the time how you're apparently some establishment hack Republican and you're as conservative as they come. So I just this purity test doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's because one man's fascist is another man's rhino. You just it depends on who you're talking to and where you're at, you know, put that on a T-shirt. Uh, that's funny. That's uh, all right. Let's keep moving. We're almost out of time here. Uh, a couple quick hits here. So I'm sure Chris and Oliver just want to maybe say, uh, we told you so, but people are finally now figuring out that Gary Grasso is uh, the mayor of Burr Ridge and he is circulating petitions for House District 82. So that's going to set up a pretty nasty primary there in House District 82. It's a Republican district. Some Democratic blogs are trying to claim that Democrats uh, uh, have an opening in that district. They don't. Uh, it's pretty solidly Republican. But uh, that primary is going to be pretty rough. What are you guys hearing about uh, 82 down there? Yeah, so Grasso is official, it's official in the news now that Grasso is circulating in the 82nd House District. Um, we've known this for a while. He's originally looking at the six. Now he's thinking, he, well, he knows that no Republican can probably win the six this cycle. So he's going to look at the more Republican open district that he lives in. Um, I know Gary's been calling a lot of the influencers and people in the district and um, not really getting the response that he probably wants right now. Um, so mm -hmm. it's certainly going to be an interesting race. I think this race is going to come down to um, how much, how well Gary Grasso is going to do in DuPage County, um, because those silly, silly people in DuPage County just don't know how to vote. So um, he'll win DuPage County. And the question is how much. It's going to be a close race in the 82nd House District between him and Nicole Laha. So keep an eye out for it. Things are going to get interesting. So I think what's interesting when I hear in DuPage County is like, oh, Nicole Aha, that girl's running against Gary Grasso. So it's not like, so like for, for those who've been paying attention, Nicole Aha has wanted this seat since Durkin stepped down a little while back. So this isn't a new ambition for her. For me, this just feels like Gary Grasso kind of latching on to the next opportunity. And for just a note, Chris, my folks in DuPage County, they listen to this podcast and they've been taking exception to some of your DuPage County commentary. So I'd be I'd be I'd be watching yourself. They I mean, this continues that comment. They this continues the, uh, the, the back and forth between uh, Green Bay and Detroit. Now, Cook County versus DuPage County. This is fun. I like this. They can take exception to my commentary on their stupid county when they start voting the proper way and not having aneurysm every What's time. What's the proper way? That Chris's way is apparently the, way the proper argument. way, right? <laughs> the way I want them to vote. Stupid question. God. I mean, listen, this is going to be a tough primary. Um, we, I've said it now a couple of times as this has come up. And I would imagine that, and by the way, someone who uh, knows Nicole very well sent me a text that it's Weirkin. 
uh, that hopefully I did that right. Thank you very much for sending that along um, and the proper pronunciation, but we'll continue to call her Laha. So uh, just so that we don't screw it up in the future out of respect. Uh, this is going to be a tough primary and I've certainly got some thoughts on how each of them can win, but no one really cares about my thoughts on how you win that race. So we'll just continue to be observers on how this plays out. But Nicole being a staffer on the Senate side um, and clearly the choice of Republicans on the House side for a House district, uh, my point of bringing up both caucuses is she's going to have a lot of friends and allies in both caucuses. The mm -hmm. party, I'm sure, is going to come full barrel in for her in this race. Um, and they're going to want to take this opportunity to get a suburban female in a district uh, to start mm -hmm. to get more females into the Republican caucus down in Springfield. So they're going to come in with their full weight. Um, but Grasso has shown an ability to fundraise. He's got a lot of name recognition. Uh, I, this thing's going to get bloody and it's probably going to get nasty. Uh, and uh, obviously it's not great for the party, but there's a reason why we have scrimmages. So uh, we're going to keep an eye on this race for sure. I mean, she's out working hard, so um, I think she's really aware of that fact as well. So, I mean, I think Gary's going to lean on his experience and his connections, and she's she's really working hard, and I've seen her out at a lot of events, so more to come. All right, let's shift over to House District 42. Oliver, uh, you've got news and a new challenger against Tara Costa Howard in what is potentially on the edge of being a winnable district for Republicans. So... I, I really don't think this is a winnable district. I've, I've Glen Ellen and Lombard had really started to kind of go go blue. But uh, so Steph, uh, Stephanie Trussell, she was a lieutenant governor candidate with uh, Darren Bailey last cycle. I know actually before Darren Bailey wanted her to run as his as lieutenant governor, she was looking at this seat two years ago. So I, this is always something I think that's been a bit of a passion project for her. So um, it sounds like she's going to pull the trigger on running. Um, best of luck to her. I mean, hopefully she gives Tara Coster to Howard a good run. But again, I, I really do think this seat's kind of out of reach for Republicans at this point. Listen, it's just a weird district. I mean, I'm looking at some of the past numbers and... Uh, progressive tax went down by 13% in that district. I mean, that's a huge margin. Uh, 2018 mm -hmm. Illinois Gov's race, we only lost it by five, but they really, really don't like Trump. In 2020, um, it, Trump lost by 24 points in that district. So it's definitely, I think it's a very anti-Trump district, but I don't think it's a very anti-Republican district. But because of that Trump factor and some other factors, our nominee last time lost by almost 17 points. Um, in a in a perfect world, you take out that Trump factor. I think it's more like R5, but with the Trump factor, I know it's not R5. I get it. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't see this district as being completely out of the realm of possibility. So we uh, we wish wish Miss Tressel the uh, the best of luck. I know she was kind of looking for what's next, maybe thinking about a podcast or you know what she was going to do next. So it's nice to know what's next on the docket for Stephanie Tressel. And let's mm -hmm. see what happens. Uh, certainly, uh, at, at minimum, it gives us a candidate who's going to work for the district. So I'll take that and we'll see if uh, yeah. uh, she can mount a serious challenge. All right. With only a few minutes left, let's get through these last things pretty quickly. Uh, House District 99, Representative Freeze, as we've talked about, is not running for uh, re-election there in a very Republican district. It looks like he has his choice on who he wants to take over for that, um, which is Kyle Moore. Uh, it's funny, Kyle Moore is a name I've heard over the years, just as somebody young. Uh, he was the Quincy mayor. Uh, and he was talked about for a long time as being an up and comer and maybe even in that region, the future of the Republican Party. People really talked up Kyle Moore and he kind of fought, fell away, wasn't in the limelight as much from what I heard, got pretty busy in his personal life and professionally. What looks like now he's making a, a I wouldn't say a comeback, but he's certainly coming back here and he's going to be running for that House District 99 seat. So uh, I haven't heard any other names looking at it. But again, Kyle Moore was somebody who was really highly thought of not that long ago as somebody who had a lot of potential. So I'm excited to see him come back uh, and we'll see if anybody annou else announces for that district. Anyone else have any uh, news on House District 99 or is that uh, is that everything we know so far? I like covered it. Covered it. Yep. All, All right. right, quick hits. Uh, Senate District 37. Uh, another candidate has announced, Tim Yeager is announced. Um, he was He is a Henry County board member. This is the old Wynn Stoller district. Chris Bishop is the other Republican candidate. There are many people who think that that's, this isn't the end. We'll have more candidates. Right now we have two. So just keeping you guys informed. Right now we have two candidates in that district. Anybody have thoughts or we keep moving? Hearing nothing, I'm going to keep moving. All right, let's go. Uh, next thing is 
Uh, we keep bringing this up. House District 79, uh, Jackie Haas. I don't know what's in the water there and why everybody wants to go after Jackie Haas, but there's now a third candidate in that race uh, wanting to run against Jackie Haas. Now, Michael, you got it. There you go. You can't, can't unmute while I'm talking. Uh, Larry Kirkstra is now in that race. In previous weeks, you we talked about Billy Morgan running, Geneva Walters running. There's now a third candidate. What's going on? Why is everybody so desperate to challenge Jackie Haas and what is a Republican district? Uh, I just said same thing happened last year. There was like three people in the Democratic primary for this seat. Um, so there must be some massive Democrats are looking at that I'm not looking at to make them think this district's in play for them. It's not, especially it's a very rural district. So the Trump effect isn't really going to exist out there. In fact, it's going to be towards the Republicans, not against them. So I don't know. It's one of those areas where there's not many other opportunities for Democrats to have seats. So when this, something like this comes up, um, everybody kind of jumps at it. So that's what I'm assume, assuming is happening. I mean, even Trump won the district by one point. So I mean, when you look at Haas, she won her last race by almost 17. Trump even won it by one. There are no signals here that this is even remotely in play for Democrats. So the fact that they're all lining up is pretty interesting to me, but I guess we'll keep an eye on the race. All right, next, uh, Bradley Fritz in House District 74. Uh, young up-and-comer in the party in a very Republican district. He has a challenger, David Simpson. That district's super Republican. I don't really think it's a race even we need to be too concerned about. Fritz has shown he's a pretty hard worker, so I'm not worried about 74. But uh, bring it up just in case anybody has anything to talk about there in 74. I would just say it just, all these races just show that the Democrats are doing a good job of recruiting people to run for literally everything, even mm -hmm. if they have, like, no chance whatsoever, you know, um, and that's something that we have to get better at, which I think we will with time, but it's part of it. Yeah, I mean, they're they're lapping us on uh, candidate recruitment. You're not wrong. All right, quick, uh, Oliver, just give us a quick update on DuPage County. I know you've got a candidate there circulating for, for clerk. You've got an update on the new chief judge. Uh, just give us the uh, the fast version of those if you could. Yeah, so so the biggest concern was that, you know, we had all of our countywide set to go except for our circuit clerk, and we were really struggling to find a candidate. So Jeremy Wang, he's a local attorney from the Downers Grove area. He's been supporting candidates behind the scenes for a number of years. So it's exciting to see someone getting um, getting this opportunity to run countywide, and I, I wish him all the best. So um, this, this um, chief judge, this happened a few weeks ago. Um, but I wanted to wait a little bit because I know there was a lot of backstory and I wanted to make sure I had it all for you guys. So um, Bonnie Wheaton, she actually supported, she was elected as a Republican probably before any of us were alive. Um, and she's been on the bench for quite some time. But recently she started caucusing with Democrats. And I think this whole situation is is another indicator of how much the judiciary is changing in DuPage with sub-circuits with the Democrats slowly taking over the judiciary. Like, I think we've seen DuPage go blue, but I think the judiciary was kind of that last piece that really resisted that that transition. But I think we're finally, you know, starting to see see that transition take place. And uh, um, again, this is my, my reminder, please pay attention to your judicial races. They are so, so important in your community. Please continue to pay attention. Who you elect to the bench matters so much, and they're on the bottom of the ballot, but, that doesn't make them any less important. So I just, that's my plug for, for make sure you pay attention to your judges. I wholeheartedly support that. All right, we're over time, but you know what? It's not going to be news if we don't talk about it now. So let's just quickly talk about presidential. Uh, we had the debate this week. Trump went to visit UAW. Um, and I know we've got some updates on presidential campaigns are struggling to recruit delegates in this state. Maybe let's start here on the debate. Um, anybody's thoughts on the debate and Trump going to visit the UAW workers. We didn't get to cover that last week. And I know Chris uh, probably had some thoughts on that. So why don't we uh, jump in real quick on, on what we heard there? So the presidential debate was a colossal waste of time. Every person who watched the debate said it was completely was worse than the first debate, which is insane to hear yeah. because of how bad the first debate was. Stop watching Republican no. presidential debates. No. They are nothing. It is the unemployment line on your television screen. Do not watch them. Um, the Trump was at the UAW, was, was visited UAW workers in Michigan. It was a smart political maneuver. If you want to hear more about it, read the article in The Guardian uh, that came out today regarding the presidential candidates and the uh, positions on um, the unions. So that's it.
And uh, yeah, Chris, I mean, let's, Chris got a whole interview on it. Maybe Lane could bring up that headline so people can Google it. Um, Chris had a whole interview in national press about um, Trump's strategy here and reaching out to uh, unions and how some of the Republican candidates have, have positioned themselves as anti-union. He also took a pretty big whack at my preferred presidential candidate. So uh, Chris is just lucky he's up in Wisconsin right now and I'm in Southern Illinois, but uh, I'll find some way to get back at you. Well, it's pretty sad, Chris. If we're a party that wants to open open up and be more big tent, then why would we have to all blindly follow one candidate and not let all the other candidates at least have a chance to talk? I think it's great. And it shows the Democrats all fall in line. Look at all the Republicans. We have a wide variety of opinions and ideas. That's they sad. all should have they their have opportunity their to talk. They... That doesn't mean that people are actually going to listen because President Trump is going to run away with this and – Everybody just needs to see the writing on the wall. I'm glad to see that he went and spoke to the UAW because, like you said, if we're going to expand our tent, then we need to look for opportunities like that with union members and um, not government unions, obviously, but like private sector unions and also some of the minorities groups that um, that Trump does very well with. So let's just keep adding and adding and adding and. Hopefully everybody just gets on board like they should. You know, we can't be a party well, of individualism and competition. If I'm we not saying that you can't be an individual. Party. I'm just saying there's a time for that. And now's the time for that. But pretty soon it won't be. Interesting. Well, listen, I, I think everyone, I didn't watch the debate. I'll admit I had better things to do. And then there's a long list of things I find better to do than watch those debates. But for everything I'm hearing, DeRay, your boy Vivek did not do super great. Well, I would agree with that. It's interesting. He did a complete 180. In the first debate, he was bashing all the other people. And now his whole message was everyone should come together and we're all Republicans, which I kind of respect. But I think that the real winner of this debate was actually uh, Doug Burgum. And I think it's really telling that that these debates reward people who aren't good on policy. I'm serious. These That's why Tim Scott, he knew he had to go in swinging. Chris Christie's always been good at debates. Donald Trump has always been good at debates because they go after other people and attack. But the people who actually put forth policy solutions like Nikki Haley or Doug Burgum, they kind of get left behind. And I think you'd be remiss to not at least watch the first 40 minutes and see that Doug Burgum actually has a pretty good plan for what he could do as president. That's just my idea. I think I think uh, the, the Z crew has gotten to DeRay. He's on the payroll now. No, 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 no. He he will get three percent. He is the Paul Schimpf of national politics. He will go nowhere. Oh, but I still think that he has some good ideas. Paul, Paul Schimpf had more governing chops, but uh, and less money. But I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, Oliver, I know you were uh, you were making faces. What were your thoughts? So it pains me, but like DeRay is not wrong about Doug Burgum. He actually had some pretty good points. He's not going to win. And it, it pains me to say it, like everything my body doesn't want to like this man. But I, I also agree with Chris that this debate felt more relevant than the last one. Ron DeSantis is now going after Trump. And if he's going after, after Trump, he knows he's screwed like the rest of them and he's going to lose this race. So, I mean, everyone has the good points, but I don't think it inevitably changes the conclusion of what's going to happen um, in these primaries. So Bergam is going to make a great uh, cabinet secretary, like energy or something like that. I can see it but now. You, I think it's healthy that in our party, we have the conversations. We have all the personalities. We have the people who are going to be strong on policy. We have the people that are going to be strong on going after the opposition and attacking. We have people who are going to be uniters. We have people who are going to be dividers. I think all those personalities are helpful because it shows, look, Republicans are the party that are able to work things out internally and fight for it because they're fighting for the people. I don't think the Democrats have that. They have get in line or get off. All right, last thing on this as we don't, uh, as we run out of time here, but I know we've got some news on the delegate selection process because candidates who want to run for delegate in the state have to start passing petitions in just a few short weeks. Uh, and I know some of the campaigns we hear are struggling to find people who will run as delegates. Uh, Michael, I know you had some updates on this. Uh, I think others might have had some updates. Let's give this real quick and then we'll close down. If you want to be a delegate, there's a lot of candidates and campaigns that are still looking for people. I know Ron DeSantis is having a hard time in deep 
Southern Illinois, trying to find um, delegates and alternates, um, Tim Scott, others. So I think all the Trump slots are just about taken, which isn't a big surprise because everybody knows what the end result is going to be. But if you want to get on one of these vanity campaigns, there's plenty of opportunities. I, mean, I hear uh, I hear DeSantis is really struggling to fill slots right now. Well, yeah, and I had someone talk to me about that. He's like, well, everyone's saying I should be a delegate. And I'm like, well, do you even really support DeSantis? He's like, well, not really. I'm like, well, then, like, don't do it. Like, it just, it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre to me. I thought DeSantis had more support, especially here in the suburbs. So. All right. Well, look at the time. Uh, next thing in the agenda is Chicago, but uh, we're out of time. So. Uh, Chris and his frozen camera and horrible Wi-Fi up there in Green Bay. Uh, sorry, buddy. Uh, oh, and he just caught No more Lane's, Chris, no more Packers fans. Darn. Lane's going to kill him for dropping out. And now Lane <laughs> has to move around all the uh, all the tags manually. So uh, Chris, just now he's on everybody's crap list right now. But sorry, buddy. No time to talk about Chicago. Hope you do well. Uh, I, uh, I think I, we're all Lions fans today. So, uh, hopefully, uh, the Packers do poorly and, you guys lose and we'll all, we'll all cheer for Oliver and her team, but thank you guys for joining me. Uh, thanks to Chris, kind of to you three. Uh, I love you much more than I love Chris, Abby, Michael, Matt. Thank you guys. Uh, and, uh, please thank you to our watchers, our listeners, please like, and subscribe. I'm gonna go ahead and do an event with Michael down in Butlerville down here. And then tomorrow and Saturday, I've got a training up in Durayville up in Lake County. So I'm running all over the state over the next couple of days. I'll probably see some of you guys in person, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those of you who watch and share, and we'll come back at you next week with more news, more information, more debate, and more horrible takes on football teams. Catch you next week. Mm -hmm.